Good evening. Do you hear me? Those who are at the back. Louder, let's see. Maybe from there, I think. Now? It's better. Okay, great. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, tonight we are kicking off the eighth annual week of Islamic art and culture at John Carroll University. Over the years, this week has enriched and brought diversity to our campus. It has helped our community to understand the Islamic tradition. So if you do not have one, please take a flyer with the rest of the week's events when you leave tonight. The flyers would be at the door and they are available. Before introducing His Excellency uh, Archbishop um, Michael Fitzgerald, I would like to invite the Chair of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, uh, Dr. Sheila McGinn, uh, to give uh, a brief welcome uh, words. Uh, please, Dr. McGinn. Thank you, Dr. Sar Toprak. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out to this week of Islamic arts and culture. And we're very delighted and proud uh, to have Archbishop Fitzgerald as our keynote speaker opening uh, this week's events. Uh, many of you have been to John Carroll before. Those of you who haven't, please take time to, you, you'll you'll notice some usual suspects. They tend to have laptops and are taking notes and stuff. Uh, so there'll be students around, you know, please chat with them uh, afterwards about uh, other types of things like this that are happening on campus. Um, also, I'm supposed to make a little announcement about, about the handout. Uh, we happily, uh, in some ways, have run out, which means there are more people here than we thought were going to come. Um, so this will be a community building experience. Uh, if you have a handout, you are a person of honor, and uh, please share with those around you. Um, <clears throat> maybe get a, get, maybe get a, you know, uh, an autograph later. Who knows? <clears throat> uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask Dr. Sara Toprak to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGinn. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Archbishop uh, Michael Fitzgerald. Uh, I met Archbishop Fitzgerald for the first time, uh, I don't know if he's rem he, he remembers, when he was Bishop Fitzgerald uh, in what must have been 1999 or 2000 at Georgetown University. Uh, on that occasion, I had a chance to ask him a question and tell him a story. Um, since that time, I had the chance to ask him, uh, I, had, I had been following his career and reading his writings. Since then, our paths have crossed several times at various scholarly, interfaith, and dialogue-related events. Last year, it was a great honor to be a keynote speaker with him at an interfaith conference at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne. He is humble and generous, as the Quran describes. He's talking about the Quran, and actually the Quran describes priests to be humble and generous. When I heard that he was coming to John Carroll, I was overjoyed for two reasons. One, the presence of such a great personality would bring tremendous insight and respect to the university. Second, I felt that I am no longer the only Islamicist on campus. <laughs> so thanks to God, we have at least temporarily a world-renowned Islamicist on campus. Those who have been here the last two weeks already are familiar with the, online, uh, with the outline of his biography and CV, but it's my job to refresh your memory 
So please bear with me. Michael Fitzgerald was born in Walsall, UK in 1937. He looks younger, I can tell you. <laughs> Ordained as priest as a member of the Society of Missionaries of Africa, White Fathers, in 1961. He obtained his doctorate in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in 1965, and a BA with honors in Arabic from the School of Oriental and African Studies, London University in 1968. After many years of teaching and pastoral work, in, 1960, in 1991, Father Fitzgerald was appointed titular bishop of Nepte and was ordained by Pope John Paul II on January 6, 1992. On October the 1st, 2002, he was appointed president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue and was raised to the rank of Archbishop. In 2006, he was appointed apostolic nuncio in Egypt and delegate to the League of Arab States. On his retirement on October 2012, he took up residence at St. Anne's in Jerusalem. Among his many publications are Science of Dialogue, Christian Encounter with Muslims, published in 1992 with Robert Casper, and Interfaith Dialogue, A Catholic View, published in 2006 with John Borelli. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Archbishop uh, Fitzgerald. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Sarito Prak. I can well understand that he doesn't want to be alone as the Islamicist in John Carroll. I had this experience myself in Makerere in Kampala. I went as an assistant to the Muslim lecturer there in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies it was there. And after the first semester, he went back to his own country, which was next door, Kenya. And I was left alone <laughs> until the next man came, who came for the last part of my second year, which was there. So it, it's hard to cover everything. And it, I've been very happy to share with uh, Dr. Zeki and also encouraged by him because when we were discussing what I should give here at uh, John Carroll, he suggested that I should talk about the Quran. And I think that's very courageous of you, really, to allow someone who is you know, who's not of that religion to talk about the, the sacred book of that religion. So that has given me confidence and um, anyway let me also thank him for allowing me to initiate this eighth Islamic week of art and culture. We're going to have a little extra thing in the middle of my talk when and I'll signal to him when we get to it. The, in fact, this talk this evening is in two parts because I'm combining two meditations. Please come in. We have space down here, please. As I said, mentioned in the introductory call, talk, the um, meditations on the beautiful names of God have been arranged by me in accordance with the, the flow, the dynamic of the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius. And in the spiritual exercises, once the firm foundation of the meditation on the purpose of creation has been laid, 
the retreatant is led to reflect on sin. Yes, as we have seen, God is the best and most generous of creators. But if we are honest with ourselves, we have to admit that we do not respond with like generosity. We are often, and to an alarming degree, wrapped up in ourselves. And the meditations of the first week of the exercises are aimed at making us conscious of our sinful state. But the purpose is not to wallow in sin, nor to be depressed by the realization of the great distance that separates us from God, but with gratitude to know God as merciful and forgiving. As I pointed out in the introductory course, there are plenty of seats, so do not be afraid to come in and take seats. As I pointed out in the introductory talk, the names of God form a bridge between God and human beings. But it's only God who can build this bridge. The initiative is always on God's side. And so the first part of the reflection this evening wishes to show that God, the creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, God the Almighty, even if he is the most high, the holy one, the transcendent God, doesn't remain remote from his creation. He is close to us. He sees everything. He knows us intimately. And strengthening this awareness of the proximity of the one who in biblical terms is truly Emmanuel, God with us, will open us up to the message that our creator is also a God, a God of goodness and mercy, who is always ready to forgive us. So let me start, as always, with the teaching of the Qur'an. In the text which was given in the first talk, the a text from Surah 59, the Qur'an lists a number of the beautiful names of God. And there are two which are rather difficult to translate. Al-Mu'min and Al-Muhaymin. Al-Mu'min would normally translate, if you're translating the Arabic, it would normally translate as the believer. And it's true that some Muslim theologians have seen in this name, Al-Mu'min, an indication of God's uncreated faith in himself. God as the one who authenticates himself and authenticates his messenger by his supreme veracity. And yet, believer would hardly seem to be an appropriate name for God. There's another possible translation of al-mu'min, the one who gives security. Security, aman. And an Indian translator of the Quran, Yusuf Ali, prefaces his explanation of this passage from the Qur'an with the following words. How can a translator reproduce the sublimity and the comprehensiveness of the magnificent Arabic words which mean so much in a single symbol? And he renders al-mu'min as one who entertains faith who gives faith to others, who is never false to the faith that others place in him. And hence he paraphrases it, guardian of the faith. Another translator proposes, grantor of security. 
And this last mentioned translation receives confirmation from the connection of this name to the other one, Al-Muhaymin, translated by Abdul Halim as guardian over all, and by Yusuf Ali as the preserver of safety. We actually find this term Al-Muhaymin in the Quran in Surah 5, verse 48, in the context of the sending down of the Quran, which is said to confirm the scriptures that came before it, preserving them, preserving them from all alteration. So we can say God watches over both his creation and his revelation. The nearness of God, the protector, the nearness of God to his creatures is often expressed in the Quran. And I think we, there is a text which is very well known, I think. It's from Surah 50, verse 16. We created man. We know what his soul whispers to him. We are closer to him than his jugular vein. Now this text appears in a context of judgment. God knows everything. But it also shows how near God is to the human being he has created. And there are other texts that emphasize this close attention that God pays to human beings. Quran 2, verse 186. Prophet, if my servants ask you about me, I am near. I respond to those who call me. So let them respond to me and believe in me so that they may be guided. God's guidance will be the topic for next week's talk. So I'll leave it to next week. But what I want to emphasize tonight is the nearness of God. In another passage, Surah 34, verse 50, Muhammad is commanded to say, Say, if I go astray, that is my loss. And if I am rightly guided, it is through what my Lord has revealed to me. He is all hearing and ever near. He is Karib. A Karib is not the, the God, the one who is near, is not found in the list of names used as a basis for the meditations that I have produced. But it does figure in other lists of the 99 names. And there are also other names that give expression to divine proximity. God is Al-Alim, Al-Alim rather, the all-knowing. God is Al-Basir, the all-seeing. He is Al-Samir, the all-hearing. He is Al-Khabir, the one who is sagacious or the well-informed. He is Al-Mujib, the one who answers prayers. And it's not difficult for God to have all these qualities because he is the one who is present the witness, a shaheed. The shaheed has both meanings of being present and being witness. As the Quran says, God witnesses everything you do. And there's an interesting text that underlines this omnipresence of God. Do you not see, Prophet, that God knows everything in the heavens and the earth? There is no secret conversation between three people where he is not the fourth, nor between five where he is not the sixth, nor between less or more than that without him being with them, wherever they may be. On the day of resurrection, he will show them what they have done. God has full knowledge of everything. And from the biblical point of view, there would be much to say about this proximity of God. I'm going to confine myself to just a few texts. In the First Testament, as God 
with us. There's an episode from the life of Isaac, which is told in Genesis. There is famine in the land, but God shows Isaac what he is to do. Do not go down to Egypt. Settle in the land that I shall show you. Reside in this land as an alien, and I will be with you and will bless you. I will be with you. And in point of fact, God is with Isaac and he has his, gives him his blessing and Isaac becomes rich. So rich that there are disputes with his neighbors, disputes concerning access to water, a very contemporary sort of thing. And with Isaac, God renews his covenant. Isaac went up to Beersheba. And that very night, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and will bless you and make your offspring numerous for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there, called on the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there. I think this is very interesting. It says, Isaac is conscious of the presence of the Lord, but he feels the need of marking the spot by leaving a memorial. So it'll be possible for him to return to this place and to remind himself that the Lord is with him. And we, we also need such markers, whether they be to places of pilgrimage or places where we have had some special religious experience. I have some friends who met in Rome and afterwards they got married and every year they go back to Rome to renew that meeting that they had in that city. There are places that speak to us. They may also be reminders of moments in our life, moments when we have had an experience of the Lord, moments to which we can return in our memories and find encouragement through that memory. Jacob's dream, described in chapter 28 of Genesis, is another example of the presence of God. He dreams that the Lord is standing beside him, saying, Know that I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And Jacob, rising in the morning, set up a stone as a pillar, and he called the place Bet-El, the house of God, a place where worship could be given to God. I've already spoken about the experience of Moses with the burnt, burning bush. Let's return to that for a minute. Moses receives a mission to go to Pharaoh so that his people can be freed. And he's alarmed. He is alarmed by this. That God says to him, I am with you. And when Moses asks God to reveal his name, God replies, I am who I am. Or, according to a different translation, I will be what I will be. This laconic and enigmatic reply can be understood in different ways. I am who I am. I don't want to tell you who I am. <laughs> I am what I am. I am the one who is. Ah, uh -huh, that is a bit different. I am the one who is in contrast to the false gods who are nothing. I am who I shall be. I will always be there. 
I will be there with you in a way which will become evident. But we can also remember the first song of the servant in the book of the prophet Isaiah, where the Lord says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, Khalil, in the Islamic tradition, Abraham is Khalil Allah, the, the friend of God, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from the farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will help you with my victorious right hand. And a little further, on, a little further on in the same chapter, we find this profession that God makes of his own identity and at the same time a promise. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, do not fear, I will help you. In other words, the Lord's presence is a guarantee of his help. And this we see also in the New Testament. This is a constant message in the New Testament. It's found in the angel's message to Mary at the Annunciation, which we will celebrate this coming Thursday. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. And then afterwards, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. But this presence of God, this being with, is also in the message given to Joseph. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And Joseph is instructed to give to this son which will be born of Mary the name Jesus. But the child receives another name also in fulfillment of the prophecy. Matthew's Gospel quoting uh, Isaiah 7.14 Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call him Emmanuel. And the evangelist explains this name. God is with us. Jesus will remain Emmanuel even after his death and resurrection. When sending his disciples to out to bring the good news to the entire world, he promises them, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Yet Jesus is not only with us, he is also in us. Speaking to his disciples after the Last Supper, he says, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. That is in St. John's Gospel in chapter 14. And chapter 15 continues this theme with the image of the vine. Jesus is the vine stock, and his disciples are the branches. And in this short passage, verses 1 to 17, we find the verb abide 11 times. Abide in me as I abide in you. And I think that there we have in an outstanding way an expression of the communion to which the meditation on this name of God, God who is near, God who is one with us, this communion to which this meditation can lead us. 
but let us pause for a while and listen. We're going to have tonight, because these talks are on the names of God, we're going to listen to these 99 names chanted for us. You will see that the, each name the, is written in Arabic, but there is also the English given as well. Zeki for supplying this chant of the names. Hey girl. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, as you may have realized, the, the, the recitation of the names ends with a prayer, really. So we're going to go on to the second part of the talk on the God of goodness and mercy. Because this creator God, the God most high, is also the God with us. He is all-knowing. He knows of what we are made. He knows our weaknesses. But this almighty God is also mighty in love. 
He is a God of tenderness and mercy, a God always ready to grant pardon. And when we reflect on the pardon of God, which is always offered, or rather on God who pardons, we make the strange discovery that this God is also a God of anger. That his anger is directed towards those who are stubbornly proud and who don't admit that they are sinners. His pardon is for those who return to him. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I think we're probably quite familiar with this invocation which is found at the beginning of each surah of the Quran except one, surah 9. But I'd like to examine it more closely. Rahman Rahim. The root Rahamim from this root is derived the word Rihm, which means the womb. And so this root suggests a connection with maternity, or we could say with a seat of affection, which in biblical terms might be designated the bowels of mercy. And in this Quranic invocation, there are two words, a Rahman and a Rahim, which are both used as names of God. The first of these words is a noun, and the second, uh, an adjective. The noun is in the augmentative form that indicates an intensity of the quality. And so applied to God, and in fact it is never applied to anyone or anything else other than God, a Rahman indicates that this quality belongs to God to the highest degree. We could say that it characterizes God. In fact, in pre-Islamic inscriptions that have been found in what is present-day Yemen, South Arabic inscriptions, the word Rahmanan, where the an at the end replaces the, the definite article at the beginning, this word Rahmanan is used for the name of God in the Jewish tradition and also for the Christians for God the Father. I think Islam has tended to make abstraction of the paternal aspect of this love as also of the maternal aspect, considering it unsuitable to be attributed to God. Yet the sense of goodness remains. So that's Rahman. Rahim is an adjective qualifying the God who is giving expression to his Rahma. But what is Rahma? Well, Rahma is often translated mercy or compassion. And in fact, the usual English translation of this invocation, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, is in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. But there are drawbacks to this translation. It doesn't bring out the fact that the two names come from the same root and that one of them is a noun and the other one an adjective. And moreover, Rahma doesn't really mean mercy, it means more tenderness, kindness. <coughs> so we could say that this Rahman Rahim could be translated the good God of goodness or the bountiful God of bounty. The translation that I'm using in class is, gives the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. So Rahman is one of the names for God. And we find in the Quran this statement in Surah 17, say to them, call on God, Allah, or on the Lord of mercy, Rahman. Whatever names you call him, the best names belong to him. So Allah, 
and Rahman are presented, presented in parallel fashion. Rahman was probably unknown in Mecca at the time of Muhammad, whereas Allah was very well known. It might have been considered as a foreign god. And so the Quran is here giving reassurance that whether you use Rahman or Allah, you are calling on the same god. One of the surahs is called a Rahman. It's Surah 55. And it speaks of the gifts of God, starting with revelation and continuing with creation. It starts, it is the Lord of mercy who taught the Quran. He created man and taught him to communicate. And after the mention of each wonder of creation comes the refrain, which then of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? <coughs> do you both deny? Why both? Because this is addressed to both human beings and the jinn, the spirits. This Surah 55 is really a song of praise to God, the, the generous one, the munificent. But also Surah Maryam, Surah 19, which gives an account of the Annunciation of the birth of Jesus, refers very, very many times to Ar-Rahman. And towards the end of the Surah, we find the following statements. The disbelievers say the Lord of mercy, that is a Rahman, has offspring. They attribute offspring to the Lord of mercy. It does not befit the Lord of mercy to have offspring. So these verses deny all possibility of generation in God. And yet there is a mysterious verse addressed in another surah to Muhammad, surah 43, verse 81. Say, Prophet, if the Lord of mercy truly had a son, I would be the first to worship him. It's a conditional sentence. The interesting thing for grammarians is that the, uh, the uh, what is it? And the particle in, if, is used and not lao. In means a possible condition, whereas lao is usually a hypothetical condition. It could never be fulfilled. So here the impression is given that the possibility is real. In Surah 19, the same Surah, at the end, in, surah nine, in verse 96, there's a very open definition of the just one who will be rewarded by God. The one who believes and who does righteous deeds. And it is said here that God will show love for the just. And here, then, we find another name for God, Al-Wadud the loving or the very loving. Ask forgiveness from your Lord and turn to him in repentance. My Lord is merciful and most loving. And different interpretations are given for this name. It's sometimes considered to be the equivalent of an active participle then. So it refers to God loving God who loves his good servants, those who are near to him his saints, the awliya. In this sense, God is the friend of the believers. But it can be taken as an intensive form also, equivalent to saying, God strong in love. Or it can be understood as a passive. God is the one who is loved, the loved one, the one who is loved by the believers, by his good servants. Usually the commentators try to avoid attributing love to God, especially when another verb is used, hub. They consider this something too human, 
and so not worthy of God. But there are two passages in the Quran where it is said that God loves and where these, this love is the, the, the root ha ba ba is used. You who believe, if any of you go back on your faith, God will soon replace you with people he loves and who love him. I think it's interesting to see that the love of God comes first and the human love comes as a response to this divine love. Another text, say, if you love God, follow me and God will love you and forgive you your sins. God is most forgiving, most merciful. And so we come to another name for God, the God who forgives, another root, Rain fa ra. There's a surah with this name, Al Ghafir, the Forgiver. This name is found only once in the Quran and it doesn't exist in the list of beautiful names. But other forms of the same name exist. Sorry. So we have Al Ghafir. The one who pardons a single sin. We have Al Ghafur, the one who is in the habit of pardoning sins. And Al Ghaffar, the one who never ceases to pardon. And this Al Ghaffar is like Al Khabbaz. Khubs is bread, and Al Khabbaz is the one who makes bread. So, Rufran would be forgiveness. Al Ghaffar is the one who makes his business to forgive. We could say that God is the pardoner. At the beginning of Surah Al Ghafir, we find the following passage This scripture is sent down from God, the Almighty, the All Knowing, forgiver of sins and acceptor of repentance. Severe in punishment, infinite in bounty. And so this passage teaches us to hold together the two aspects of God. He will punish those who obstinately oppose his will, but he is also ready to pardon. In God there is both justice and mercy. And we have difficulty in holding these two together, but in God they are one. Let's return to the story of Moses in the Surah of the Heights, uh, Surah 7. Moses has withdrawn in order to meet God on the mountain, leaving his brother Aaron in charge of the people. The people, however, demand a tangible God, and so they have made for themselves, I quote, a mere shape that sounds like a cow. And realizing that they have sinned, they say, if our Lord does not have mercy on us and forgive us, we shall be losers. And Moses, angry and aggrieved, throws down the tablets he has received and seizes his brother Aaron by the hair. But after his brother has complained, he prays, my Lord, Forgive me and my brother. Accept us in your mercy. You are the most merciful of all who show mercy. As if he wished to enfold his brother in the mercy of God. And the God who forgives is also the one who turns ceaselessly to his creatures. He is a tawab. And he's therefore the source of all repentance, Tauba. This is the name of Surah 9, repentance. And a passage from this surah deals with the th this theme. It speaks of the, the Arabs. But I don't mean all the Arabs of the world. It, it means the inhabitants of the desert. The Bedouins. 
It's not sure whether their conversion to Islam is sincere, for they are said to be the most stubborn of all people in their disbelief. They find burdensome the financial obligations of the new religion they have adopted. Some of them are true believers. They consider their contributions as bringing them nearer to God. Towards them, God is merciful. God will admit them to his mercy. God is merciful and forgiving. And so this surah ends with a general declaration. Do they not know that it is God himself who accepts repentance from his servants and receives what is given freely for his sake? He is always ready to accept repentance. He is a tawab. He is most merciful, a rahim. Let me give something briefly from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. It's in the Psalms that we find the expression of faith in God's bountiful mercy. Just a few examples. Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The refrain of this psalm sings of God's faithfulness. But here is another example. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Now, what are these benefits? Well, forgiveness, healing. There's also the gift of fidelity and of tenderness. A share, one could say, in qualities which are found in an eminent way in God. The God who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and with mercy. And this divine goodness is source of life. God who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And then the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So God is merciful. It's in fact the self-definition that he gives during the theophany described in the book of Exodus. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name, the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. That last part causes us some difficulty. But let us turn to Hosea, who gives a daring portrait of this God of tenderness. He describes a love which is paternal. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And going back over its history, the people can call to mind how God led them like a small child. But they did not know that I healed them. And there is divine disappointment here. My people went on turning away from me. And what is God's reaction? It's revealed as being one of patience, tenderness, which could be qualified as maternal, paternal or maternal. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst and I will not come in wrath. Can it be said that God is a mother for us? 
It's already been shown in the Canticle of the Rock of Israel in Deuteronomy. Now, the author contrasts the faithfulness of the rock with the lack of the faith, with the lack of faithfulness of the people. He abandoned God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you or that begot you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. To beget is the function of the father. To give birth is certainly the role of the mother. Let me turn to the New Testament then. The God merciful and gracious, this self-definition given to Moses, we find another definition in the letter of John, the first letter of John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows of God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. But I think we need to continue this passage. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might have life through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. In other words, we are invited to assimilate the qualities designated by the names of God. If God is love, then love should characterize our relations, our relations with our brothers and sisters, whoever they may be. And out of love, God is merciful. It's Above all, Luke, the, the evangelist Luke, who insists on the mercy of God. And we find in chapter 15, the three parables about divine mercy. But we can also see the tenderness of Jesus. As Jesus came near and saw the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. In weeping over this city, which doesn't want to receive his message of salvation, Jesus shows his love for the holy city. But we could perhaps ask, how efficacious are these tears? Jesus wept also for his friend Lazarus, but on that occasion, his compassion led him to raise Lazarus from the dead. Here, it is his passion, with his, to his passion that the tears will lead. To a death outside the city, but for the city, and for the people, and indeed for the multitude. Jesus had already lamented over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus wished to gather, to bring into unity, but like the prophets before him, he met with opposition. He won't be saved miraculously from the hands of those who are seeking his death. He doesn't try to escape. On the contrary, he moves forward with open eyes. He is in solidarity with all those who suffer for the sake of justice. He knows what is going to happen to him. He had foretold it. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chiefs, priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And during his passion, Jesus will receive a new name, Ecce Homo. Behold the man, here is the man. And at that moment, Jesus represents those who have no name, 
those who are without rights, those who are without a protector. And so we could say that the meditation on the tenderness of God crystallized in Jesus necessarily opens up the perspective of the cross. And as Christians, we are called to share in the merciful tenderness of the Lord. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. That is Luke's version. In Matthew we have, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be merciful. How are we going to be merciful? Well, Luke tells us, he continues, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. There is a saying in Arabic, al-hukm lillah, judgment belongs to God. And Matthew explains to us that our pardon is linked to the pardon coming from the Father. If we pardon, we shall be granted pardon. But we could say with Paul that we must ourselves pardon others precisely because we have received the Lord's pardon. I quote from Colossians 3. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, meekness and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must, for must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds together everything in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. Just one further quotation from Paul, and then we end. He says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so the experience of divine mercy leads to mission, bringing to our world this message of mercy which it so badly needs. And this is surely why Pope Francis has proclaimed a year of mercy to take place from December the 8th of this year to the Feast of Christ the King in November 2016. For Christians, the mission of mercy means being conformed more and more to Jesus Christ, whom we recognize as our King and Savior. Through meditation and prayer, we have always to discover how God wants us to fulfill this mission. And this would be the concern of the rest of the retreat on the beautiful names of God. Thank you for your patience. It was a great, great lecture. Uh, we have time for questions. Um, so please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question, and I will bring the microphone to you. Really? And raise your voice, maybe. I cannot see you. So there is no question. It sounds like everything was very clear, as I said. <laughs> Yes, who?
aspire to at this time in our life to give us this magnificent seed. <laughs> Well, as someone said, it fits in very well with our season, our Christian season at the moment, which is the season of Lent, uh, reflecting on conversion also. But really, um, it's something that I have done f over many years, giving these meditations, and I wanted to write them up and put them in a book form. And I had this privilege of having the first semester of this academic year free of all obligations in order to be able to do that. So uh, these, in fact, these meditations were written first in French uh, because I was uh, more dealing with French-speaking people and I gave the retreat in, in French. And I've translated myself and I'm looking over the translation. Yeah, hasn't he translated that badly? Oh, that's... So I, I'm sort of correcting myself at the moment for the English. The French is already sent and to be printed in Rome, and the English will, will follow shortly, and the book, I hope, will come out. So that's really why it's something I had done already and I'm willing to share with people. But thank you to the TUI chair that has given me this possibility, for, and, and the department also that has... Uh, left me free to be able to do this work. Sounds like a beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, do you find it challenging to translate Arabic into English? Because the, the so many meanings of one word for horse, there are 70 words which have been used one of my confreres and somebody asked him uh, you know um, what's it like learning Arabic uh, how long does it take and he said well the first 30 years are the most difficult <laughs> <laughs> It's true, the, the vocabulary is so rich because Arabic is widespread and so the, you have words from all the different uh, cultures, the different areas where Arabic is spoken. Uh, and it is, as you see, as we see in class, we see the translations of the Quran. The Quran is particularly difficult to translate, I think, and um, words are put in brackets to explain the... the, the, the and, and I quoted Yusuf Ali saying, how can we translate these wonderful Arabic words? We can't. Uh, but for people who don't know the Arabic and who want to uh, have access to the, the Quran, we have to use a translation. Uh, it's very accurately said, it's not translation of the Quran, it's translation of the meanings of the Quran. It's an approximate translation. It's never exact. And all the time, I'm sure Professor Zeki has this experience too. You say, no, no, that's not how it should be translated. No, I, I, in fact, in his own book, he has translated himself. He hasn't, he hasn't bothered with any other translation. He has translated his own texts into English. Uh, and uh, I couldn't do that, but he has done it. Thank you. Another question? You should go and enjoy the... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So, in, in your uh, talk, you, um, you describe how the connection between the nature of God, the characteristic of God, and what we're to strive for within ourselves when you talk about the merciful nature, God is merciful. Um, so I wonder whether thinking about some of the other names of God and characteristics of God, merciful, forgiving, compassion, whether you are able to identify similar connections of, how, of guidance of what we're supposed to do within ourselves uh, to be forgiving, to be compassionate, whether you find similar teachings uh, in, the, in the Quran or in, in the Hebrew Bible or elsewhere. If 
think that's what I've been trying to say, point out, that uh, it's not just enough to say, oh God, you are merciful. But we, we, we have to take that upon ourselves also. And we can see that there is need of this in a family. We, we, you, know, you have to be, be ready to forgive or, and to sometimes take punishment if you're the child. Uh, we see that God is, is just also, so the parent needs to be just too, and yet merciful at the same time. Uh, in, in, in a couple, they have to be forgiving, um, otherwise the, the, the relationship won't last, huh? uh, because we're not perfect. We know that we're not perfect. So we, we sin and we have our own weaknesses. and. And I think that this, this, this meditation, it, it isn't that God, you know, has created us and has left us alone and just to get on with it. No. In fact, I'm going to say that next week. <laughs> um, but it's that he's created us and he, as I said today, he is with us. He is helping us all the time if we allow him to help us. If we allow God to, to help us to, to, to develop these characteristics that, that, as it were, are imitation of his own action and his own uh, attitude towards his, his creation. Because he wants good for us and so that, that he's leading us all the time. And he says also, there's a Sabbath day, have repose. So we should probably have repose. <laughs> And, and uh, relax. Yes, but you uh, a two-part question. Am I correct that the Islam has a devotion to the Blessed Virgin? And second of all, how would you refute the contention that Catholicism treats the Blessed Virgin as a goddess? Certainly, the, the uh, Islam has a great respect for Mary, the mother of Jesus, a virgin mother of Jesus. The, and um, it is true also that um, in the churches that are dedicated to Mary, uh, sanctuaries, uh, many Muslims will come and will pray. I, I'm living at St. Anne's in uh, Jerusalem, which is the, the place where Mary was born, according to one tradition that we, of course, uphold very strongly. Yes. And, uh, and, and we do have... Muslim, particularly Muslim women, who come and they want to visit this place and they, they, will, they will pray to God. Uh, and, and in um, the other uh, sanctuary in Turkey, in, in, in Ephesus, the, the House of Mary, there are many Muslims who go there, or uh, Our Lady of Africa in Algiers, which is up on the hill, they have a book with people who write in their petitions and many, many Muslims who write their petitions. So there is this uh, devotion or um, seeking intercession with God through Mary. That exists. Um, not quite sure the second part of the question. I, anyway, we'll leave it there. Yes, we have another question. Uh, during the... Uh, Chanting. One of the names of God was translated as the creator of the harmful. I was just wondering if you could unpack that a little bit for us. Adar. And they gave a lot of extension to it in the, in the chanting. It was interesting. Um, there are difficult names. Uh, but we have difficult names too in the Bible. You know, the Avenger. Well, the avenger is the, the protector of the honor, is the goel, who, who is to, to uh, and, but the, uh, the anger, we, we, mustn't, we mustn't reduce God to something that is, you know, very too, too, too soft. God, God is, God can be angry. So, um, I, I'm not sure what, the, trans, what the, the interpretation of this name would be. It's not one that I've used myself in the, in the meditations. Um, I haven't tried to avoid the difficult names, but I, I've selected them. Uh, the, it's the author of harm, I think, was, was how it was translated, no? 
Um, well, God is the creator of everything, so that's that's you know our our interpretation of this is that whatever is harmful, it's because we make it harmful. Poison is there. God created poison, I suppose. But if we use the poison in the wrong way, then it's we are responsible. It's not God who is responsible. God, God creates things and we misuse them. So is, God is, is not creating the harm that we do, but he, he has created things that, that uh, we, we can misuse them. Yeah. I think this will be the final question. It's uh, more than a question. It is to uh, let you know that Lebanon uh, is a country uh, that has uh, many uh, different factions, and that now, uh, as we are approaching the Feast of the Annunciation, this is the first country in the world that all the religions are involved in honoring all the people on this beautiful day of the Annunciation. And it is a national feast where everybody is participating. So Thank you very much for mentioning that. that. Yeah, it's, it's the, I think, the only country that has declared this feast, the 25th of March, the Feast of the Annunciation, as a, a national feast for everyone to come together. And they do. They are coming together. Uh, Christians and Muslims are coming together to, to pray on that day and to seek, you know, seek uh, reconciliations, to seek solidarity, to seek unity together. And it's a good example. Is good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for coming. And finally, I will say tomorrow we will have music uh, at 7 p.m. here at uh, this, uh, this auditorium. It is uh, Sufi music and uh, Turkish music. It's a mix of both. Uh, so you are welcome uh, greatly. After tomorrow, we will have uh, a lecture, um, a film, a film actually called The Turkish Passport, which is the story of some uh, Turkish diplomats who rescued uh, Jews during the, uh, the First World War, the Second World War. And after tomorrow, after that, uh, on Thursday, we will have uh, Professor John Paul from Georgetown University. He will be talking about Muslim Kabbalah evangelists. So you are very welcome to our other events. Thank you very much and have a good night.